I thank you, Honorable Presiding Member. Uh, I must say I'm quite privileged to be speaking uh, when you are taking the chair. Probably one of the most uh, honorable uh, members uh, and also uh, a member who consistently uh, intellectually delivers uh, to the debates of this House. <clears throat> so in that way, I am uh, quite privileged, Honorable Presiding Member. Uh, last year, when uh, the Gotabe Rajapaksa government presented its first uh, budget, <clears throat> uh, I made it a point uh, to state that uh, uh, the country cannot look upon the Northeast as the same as the rest. And uh, the most important instrument that must reflect that difference uh, is the budget. And I said that one year ago, Honorable Presiding Member, because the Northeast has been a region that has been affected by war, uh, it has been completely destroyed. The economies of the people there lag behind some 35 years, not only with regards to genuine uh, capital, uh, but also uh, with regards to capacity. So to essentially try and treat, just because the war is over, uh, that part of the country uh, in an equal footing with the rest, is to perpetuate that disadvantage because uh, you have already created a situation where they are in a rut and uh, without recognizing the fact that they are in that rut uh, and to try and in some way first protect whatever that they have and then come up with an, uh, some sort of policy that can strengthen their economy so that at some point during the course of the incumbent government's term, that they can reach a stage where they can thereafter try and compete with the rest of the country if you do not have such an approach. But rather you continue to simply forget the fact that they are 35 years behind, lagging behind, and you try and treat them on an equal footing with the rest of the country, you're perpetuating their pauperization. You're perpetuating that disadvantage and you're creating a situation where then thereafter, like what you're doing now, where you build infrastructure to build roads and various other facilities in the Northeast, you're only creating a situation where people from outside the Northeast can quite simply come to that area and take over the economy. I am not a, uh, I am not a, a person who essentially uh, takes after protectionism, but in a situation where peoples are not equal, in a situation where regions are not equal, you have to resort to such protectionism if you are to protect those people, those vulnerable people. But the previous Budget failed to do that. This budget goes even further in failing to do that. And the justification, if at all, that this government can try and give is that the rest of the country has also suffered because of the COVID pandemic. And the whole country's economy is in a bad footing. You can't compare the negativities of the rest of the country with the Northeast, the Northeast is 10 times worse, at least 10 times worse because of the COVID situation. But this government doesn't care. Not one utterance from government benches have tried to in some way address these concerns. But instead, honorable presiding member, you know that the Northeast stands on three pillars economically, fishing, farming, and to some extent, trade. But fishing continues to be 
an area where the government systematically destroys livelihoods. The Navy works in a way where it protects illegal fishermen coming into the northeast from other areas using banned methods of fishing and in the process destroying the, um, the uh, uh, fishing nets and various other assets of local fishermen. Not only that, you also have the Navy deliberately allowing foreign fishermen, fishermen belonging to India, to deliberately come into the northern waters to come and once again use illegal fishing means in the process destroying all the assets. We have repeatedly, me and my colleague, the Honorable Selvraja Gajendran, and many other honorable members of parliament belonging to the Northeast have repeatedly brought this matter up, but the government takes no actions. So for 34 years, 35 years of the war, you had the banning on fishing, and then now once the war is over, those fishermen who already are only fishing with techniques 35 years old are asked to compete with the rest of fishermen who come into their own area, use illegal means, even though those illegal means may be lucrative, use those illegal means, destroy the assets in the process. What is this? What is the outcome? Those people can't continue to survive. Farming has the same story. Hundreds of acres of land because people were chased off due to military activities have turned into forests. Now the forest department comes and declares private land, permit land that was used by those people as forest areas. Hundreds of acres. When we bring it up to the notice of the minister, the minister is not bothered. On the contrary, if there is a reallocation of those state lands, through permits, it is given to border villages, members who belong to other districts other than the Northeast. Why? To systematically try and change the demography of the Northeast. This is what is happening. This is what is happening. But when we tell these truths, members opposite, why even members on this side, when they were opposite last time, turned around and said that we are racist or that we are communal minded or that we don't want Singhalese to come and be any part of the Northeast. No, that's not the reason. But you can't pauperize the people of the Northeast to the benefit of people outside so that they can come and take over the entire area. But that is what is happening. And if this is happening despite the fact that we repeatedly bring it to the notice of this house and nothing happens and in fact things are exacerbated the wrong way, then it can only mean that it is another, another arm of the racist agenda that plagues this House, Honourable Presiding Member. We talk in terms of a unitary state. I must say, I was listening very patiently to the Honourable Dallas Allah Pirma. I was impressed by his honesty. He was honest in the sense where he said that every consecutive government after maybe the first 10 years since independence must take blame to the appalling situation to which this country has fallen. That's true. That's true. But this country began to fall not because of COVID. It began to fall that 10 years after independence because you Whichever government that came into power chose to look upon another population that inhabits this country as an enemy and because you chose to deliberately pursue policies first and foremost to destroy that, your, that perceived enemy so that they can claim no part of this island, so that they cannot say that the Northeast is their homeland, so that it can only be the Sinhalese who can call this entire island their homeland. That was the policy that was pursued that resulted in creating enemies within the state and eventually the state itself having to spend 
vast amounts of its money in trying to pursue a military option in order to continue to pursue that idea of this being purely a single Buddhist country. Well, you succeeded in the sense that you've made sure that the war was brought to an end. Well, you've had 12 years since the war came to an end. What are your achievements? What are your achievements? There is no LTT now for you to blame. Have you achieved anything in the last 12 years? The first the Mahindra Rajapaksa government for five or six years, then thereafter the Ranil Vikram Singh Maitri Palasir Zena government. What have you achieved? Every year you went down. The following year was worse than the previous. And now you have COVID where you have taken a nose dive. You're scraping the barrel. Even now, even now, you rather not reconsider your past. When we say Sri Lanka has to change, take a new path, 74 years of this unitary state has been a disaster. You have systematically plummeted the country to, the, to ground zero. Rethink. You have nothing to lose because you have hit rock bottom. Rethink, make every part of this island a plurinational country where everyone can contribute. Rethink so that the Tamil nation can ask his diaspora to contribute, to invest. But no, you rather not do that. You rather not do that. You rather cling to this notion of a unitary state and that Sri Lanka only belongs to the Singhala Buddhists and go down the path of not only destroying the Tamils, now you have started against the Muslims, but also that selfishness destroying your own soul, your own soul to commit the most heinous crimes known to mankind and fight the war and try and win the war against the Tamils, you became indebted to countries. Now what is happening? To pay that debt, you're selling off your country to those countries. In the process, you created a geopolitical contestation. Now you can't only sell off to one particular global power. Now you have to spread it out and spread it to quite a few others. Aren't you ashamed? Honestly, aren't you ashamed? Touch your heart and say whether you actually think that your children have a future in this country. I can assure you, Honorable Presiding Member, every member of this country, if given a choice, would rather have their children go abroad and get educated. Aren't you ashamed? 74 years, and this is what you have to show. Well, you have hit rock bottom, but sadly you can even hit a lower bottom. If you Honourable go down member, the path, you have two more minutes. If you go down the path that you have been going, you're going to sink even further. And you sink to such a point that your own ideal Singhala Buddhist nation will decamp. And they are decamping. I mean, the speeches in this house with regards to this uh, budget, I think quite a few members, both opposite, opposite as well as within government, uh, within uh, the opposition, were saying how so many citizens are lining up to get passports to go abroad. They are not all Tamil. vast majority of them are Singhalese. Rethink, put an end to a 74 year stupidity that has brought this country to this stage. You want a unitary state and you're not prepared to consider this as a plurinational federal state because you think federalism leads to separation. For 74 years you clung on to unitary and you created a separatist war that came under your unitary state. There was a de facto state 
when you were claiming to be a unitary state? State structure, whether it be unitary or federal, is not going to be the determining factor whether there is a separate state or not. That decision is going to be made only by making sure you prevent, in some way, convince all the peoples of this country to say that this is, in fact, their country. You failing to do that and simply saying that this is single Buddhist, you will make sure, no matter whether you have it as a unitary state till perpetuity, but you will make sure that your state will never be stable. That its legitimacy will constantly be called unto question. And one day, Honourable one day when the conclude. geopolitical realities create a situation where strong global powers feel that Sri Lanka need not be looked upon as one unit, that is when separation will take place. So you decide, as 75% of the population of the country, you decide whether you want to go down the path of 74 years of mayhem, of hell, and of disaster, where even 12 years after the end of the war, you're scraping the barrel year after year, creating new heights or new depths, I should say, or whether you want to start anew and genuinely put this country on a newer footing where Please all its honorable member. members can contribute to the upliftment of the country as a whole. Thank you. Thank you.